Hello, everyone. I typically wouldn't do an intro before a show like this, but something very interesting came up. We had a, what I would refer to as a paranormal reaction to some of the things that we were talking about, and I'll explain. Around the 30-minute mark, while we were talking about certain things happening and how the elite are in power and they don't want us to have an equal share or have what we deserve as part of the human race. And at the, around the comment, around uh, the 30 minute mark, I say, because of the inequities, and the door in the other room strangely closed very hard. Now, typically we would take something like this out, but because during the edit, right at the point where we were going over the exact same area, the door slammed again. And so it is clearly the statement is that the beings on those upper levels do not want equities. They do not want to see humans thrive. And I thought the world, I wish the world could hear this one. It, it was very, very bold and clear. So listen into the show and thank you so much. We'll let you hear it right around the 30 minute mark. You'll hear the door slam. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Androna Talks Radio. Gathering as one in our sovereign truth from a galactic perspective. Exploring our world with new ideas, knowledge and a promise of a better future. Galactic discussions for galactic minded people. Androna Talks. and thank you for joining us today at Andrana Talks Radio and we're going to get into the topic of the yellow vest again. It's not over yet. I think we're going to stick it out and go a little deeper. Some few different things have come up and so we started to step back in, into history and try to trace what some of the problems may be and and we found some really interesting things. So um, without any delay, I'm going to get right into it with uh, Chris. And as I mentioned before, Chris's uh, homeland is Belgium. And he is, uh, you know, very, his heart is in France right now. I know he's, he's in the U.S., but his heart is in France. And um, I think, it, you know, every day <laughs> we... We have a little bit of a discussion off and on, uh, you know, send a little message here and there and and uh, some of the videos, most of them are in French, but some of them are in English. And so just to kind of give me an idea of what's going on. But um, so without any delay, we're going to go right into it. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hi, Jessica. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I think, you know, we get another... Uh, what, what act is it now? They call each week an act, right? Like, yeah, like yeah. A, a play. This weekend, or yeah, it's act uh, act seventeen starting. Well, it started today uh, officially, mm -hmm. but whatever they were planning today was authorized, and then last minute they got kicked out. But tomorrow is a big one. But sixteen, which is act eighteen, gonna be pretty much old France gathering in Paris. So they're expecting t tons of people. Okay, so let's we're gonna follow up with Act 18 and what to expect, but let's let's step back a bit. And we were having a discussion about um, some of the things that have been going on in this region for a long time. I mean, Europe is, you know, there's all different. Um, powers and rulers, kings, queens, and then the um, 
all, all different types of, you know, the, the religious influences. So you have a whole bunch of uh, history here and the struggle over power. And a lot of it's happening right in that same area. Now, um, I was, I felt directed to go back and, you know, for, for me, the, the movement of Christianity, you know, stirred up a whole lot. Uh, particularly because, you know, it starts off with, you know, the, the uh, Judaism and then uh, Christianity and, and the ex, um, proclamation of Christ, you know, and who he was and creating immediately a separation and a divide uh, within Israel which then continues to trickle on. You know, you see that, um, you know, he's not accepted. It, it creates problems with uh, the Jewish people. And then it goes into this whole thing with the church, uh, the early church and the persecutions. And then, you know, there's a struggle. And then the, the church ends up becoming the aggressors somehow. Um, there's a mingling with the church and then uh, politics, which brings in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the combination of the Roman rulers, and then it goes down into what's the uh, early church fathers, they call them the, the anti Nicene, the Nicene fathers. So you have this whole thread of, of frustration, anger, uh, desire for. Um, you know, independence, beliefism, and, you know, the, the Christian church takes on many forms or reforms in different ways. And uh, it goes from one, you know, the, the Catholic church goes into the East and West. So you have the Orthodox and then the regular Roman Catholic church. And then you have, um, you know, Luther's, you know, um, reforms. And then, of course, there's all different factions of the Protestant movement. We can go on and on, and there's so much happens just in the church alone, not to mention um, other beliefisms and, and other things going on just in that region. A lot of, we'll, we'll just put it this way, there's a lot of bloodshed, and um, I'm going to start this part with um, the uh, Spanish Inquisition, which is around the 1500s. So this is when things really start to take a turn because we have the Spanish Inquisition and, um, and then under the name of Christianity, um, people uh, are brutally um, murdered and, and uh, accused of, of all sorts of things, you know, and if anything not considered not being Christian is a crime at that point, and uh, it, it introduces a violence in the same time as, um, you know, going overseas and abusing people, saying that they're barbarians, so it's okay to harm them under the guise of a Christian crusade. So, um, and we all know that a lot of these things are used to um, take money, take power, to dominate to oppress and to essentially imprison you know, large groups of people. And how do you do that through fear? Uh, the symbolism, of course, you know, becomes a weapon as well as, as uh, the levels of oppression and then further in integrating uh, Christianity into whatever um, beliefisms or pagan, they call them pagan, but I don't know which one's pagan. You start stepping away from the way that uh, things have been done. And so uh, what originally started as uh, an individual, a being, uh, stepping in here, which I believe was, you know, extraterrestrial, was the Christ energy, and, you know, comes in and then it somehow uh, takes on its own form or and, and uh, is, becomes a force, actually that is used you know, or hidden agenda behind um, the ability to use uh, to take that and wield its power against people. So, and it could be anything. 
uh, I think this is what the bottom line is. It's, it starts off, you know, they use one thing or another, and they're going to use something. If you remove the whole concept of Christianity, they would, it, they would find something else to use as a weapon to harness and control and manipulate the people. And this is, this is the agenda, the primary agenda. So getting back to the, the point where we see the um, Spanish Inquisition, and then there, there's um, this wonderful uh, video that I saw, and this is getting into the mud flood. And God bless these uh, mud flood researchers. They have found like the, the most incredible stuff amazing unearthing stuff that uh, history books have not included any school that i've gone to have gone uh, from you know the earlier uh high school years all the way up into college and i've never heard about any of this stuff but i have questioned teachers i remember questioning them about the the cities that, that are underneath the other cities and so when this information started coming out, I was like, this is fantastic. So, um, you know, I think people should really take advantage and start looking at some of this stuff. And maybe, you know, some of it does have some, you know, a little bit of, uh, of course, the people that, that were connected to Tataria really feel like they've, a lot was, was taken away from them. So they're trying to prove that, you know, hey, you know, us, Essentially, we were written out of the history books, um, but of course, there was a bigger reason for all that. And I'll leave that to them to further get into uh, the discussion. But getting back to this this time period of the 1500s, after the Inquisition, and there is a gentleman that shows shows up in history who is connected to the Jesuits, and we all know that the Jesuits are quite powerful politically. So uh, this gentleman by the name of Joseph Justice Scaliger is brought up. And then something else is interesting, who's also named alongside him, is someone by the name of Dennis uh, Patal or Dionysius Patavius, which is his real name. Uh, I mean, I, and I've said this all along, and this, uh, they are... Are they both from France, Chris? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, both of them, absolutely. So uh, potentially, um, you know, a human incarnation of Dionysus or uh, an influence carrying the name of Dionysus. And something pivotal happens at this point where we see Joseph Scaliger and uh, Dionysius Batavius, uh, both of them making a decision that relates to the um, start of the mud flood of what we know today. I mean, we have some of this stuff happening around the 1800s, but this is something happens here. Chris, can you, can you, you started telling me about this. Yeah, so Scaliger was uh, originally from south uh, west of France, and it seems a lot of these guys are from that area. So France seems to be, the, the Yellow Vest movement is way more than just what people can see on the news. The, the whole history, like you said, started way earlier in time. So what that uh, Jesuit uh, Scalinger guy did was he, they decided to literally erase all the history as pretty much we know it and rewrite it to a point where they even pretty much have add a thousand years to the whole history of, you know, Jesus, supposedly it's 2000 years ago. Um, there's a whole explanation in that video that we're going to put into the um, <clears throat> into the, the the link under. This but, is one of the was was that uh, New Earth or New is, Earth? Uh, yes, New Earth. Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, this is their their view of it. I I like to probably I personally would want to research more of it, but I do understand the idea that they did want this was planned. This I don't know how they they actually 
played the whole thing out, but this was definitely planned. And mm -hmm. like I said, the, the, well, how in the world, like I, I've said this all along, Dionysus is involved in this, and there's his name showing up in history. So, and it's not a common name, and someone could say, well, you know, it was just someone that was named after him or whatever, but um, someone that was named after him, but also used to um, bring, bring in this whole mud flood incident, you know, or the rewriting of the, the history of humanity, or the changing of history, or omitting history. It's all the same. It's a crime against humanity. It's the great deception. And as some people just say, you know, the, the history of lies. And so, you know, it's almost like we want to, if we could, we can bring someone to a high court on this one and say, hey, what's, what's going on with this game that humanity keeps experiencing? So um, we know that all of this happens. And then it goes down to um, Napoleon. And uh, then Napoleon, who was also, you know, brought in to create, uh, to fulfill an agenda. So you have, you know, the, the Jesuit influence from the Joseph Scalinger and, uh, and Dionysius uh, Patavius or Dennis Patel. And so, um, we have, you know, uh, Napoleon then comes in and he's doing something else. And so we have him going up to Russia and then there was another mud flood related incident. So now here again, the French are involved, but not the French people. It's, it's some kind of agenda that's coming from there. And we know that Napoleon is also influenced by Dionysus. I've mentioned this before as well as Macron. So, uh, Chris, you want to add a little bit about that incident? Yeah, in, in uh, 1812, Napoleon started it. Is already was very powerful in Europe. Pretty much invaded a big portion of Europe, and um, suddenly he decided to go to uh, to Russia in 1812 and start his Russian campaign. Now, the history would say that he went over there, went to Moscow, and the whole city was burned to ashes, that supposedly the Moscovite, the, the, the people of Moscow decided to burn their own city. And it was, you know, only wood can burn, supposedly all the homes were made of woods. Now, there was a video explaining a little, little bit the connection with Mud Flood 1812, which is obviously a date. Uh, and I guess you, you talked about that in an earlier report. Maybe not, not the Yellow Vest, maybe another one. But 1812, obviously, something really, something major happened on the planet uh, related to the Mud Flood. Now, when he went over there, he went with, the, with an army of 500,000 people. I mean, at that time, it's, it's, it's crazy. The the, 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 the the size of that army. Was, yeah, because, it was soldiers. Yeah. Oh yeah, soldiers, five hundred thousand, at half million. So very powerful army. So when he reached the doors of Moscow, supposedly in the history, the whole city was burned, and then he had no choices than to go back. And he thought the campaign would be supposedly very fast, and he got caught by the winter on his way back, and they pretty much all died, and he barely made it to France. Now, that's a history we can see in Wikipedia. The real history is completely different. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm outside, guys. I'm sorry if you hear a car, just please bear with me. So what's happening is, based on a video that we saw about the Met Flood and Napoleon 1812, is that obviously he went over there, he went to see uh, the Tsar Alexander. And the Tsar Alexander was not in Moscow at the time. St. Petersburg was the city where normally the Tsar were, uh, you know, living. So we don't even know if it's Moscow or St. Petersburg that really, where, where it really went. But the most interesting here is that they talk about that comet when you talk about 1812. A lot of different countries talk about a comet that stayed for many days, many weeks, for a very long time in the sky. And suppose he created all these um, earthquake and and pretty much a whole change of of the planet as we see it, 
as we know it now. What happened over there is that obviously the story is a little bit different than Wikipedia, is that when he went over there, first there was a lot of, there, there was, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of these soldiers and especially the officers were writing about what was really happening. And you will not see that in the, the history books. What they were saying is that the, the place where they were, St. Petersburg or Moscow, for me it's more St. Petersburg, was made of stone, really big buildings, like you can see now in St. Petersburg right now. So there was no homes or building made of wood. It was stone, heavy stone. So the fact that the whole city burned by itself, supposedly the, 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 the citizen of, of that city burned their own city, makes no sense. It's pretty much impossible. Because what they were talking about is that they saw that star and, and I mean, they don't know about, they didn't know about, you know, spaceship and all that, I guess, the way we know it now. But they saw something in the sky beaming a light down and suddenly out of nowhere, fire was happening. Fire that was so intense that the soldiers over there were losing their hair. They were literally vomiting and had, I mean, they were very sick. The energy of the air was completely changed. And but they, the weren't, they weren't directly affected by the fire. This was just being in that area just that they were having it almost like they had some yep. kind of radiation effect. Exactly. So that's one of these officers talking, talking about that. But it's not, not, not just a, a French officer. There are also some Russian officers uh, explaining the same thing. Now, it seems that the city was burned by a type of weapon. It was not um, just, you know, wooden homes burning. Like they did directed at energy weapons that yes. we have in California. Exactly. This was something that it was compared to. Yes, exactly. So that whole thing there pretty much led me to understand that obviously there was, no, there was obviously a non-human intervention here. Let's call it like that. Um, that pretty much created that whole mud flood situation, which might be completely connected to that whole, you know, that, that whole agenda of uh, Scalinger in the 1500 that slowly, you know, start to erase all the books, all the history books, and rewrite everything under a Christian filter of Christian prism. I guess to give more power to the, to the, to the Christian agenda. What is fascinating for me is that Everything that's important is happening in France. And I can go even earlier, even the, 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 the Christian, I mean, you, you get Rome, literally, that, you know, uh, the, the fall of Rome was around 400 and something, 500 and something uh, AD, supposedly. And then the Franks invaded France, right? With Charlemagne, Charles the Great, or Charles the First, I guess, which is a Frank. And when he invaded, he became the emperor, and the first thing he did was to literally uh, baptize himself as a Christian, and his mission was pretty much to merge, to, to, to bring more power to the, 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 the Christian agenda and spread it throughout Europe. He, he invaded, I mean, his, his, his empire was huge. He was going from Spain all the way to uh, Germany, Holland, and so on, and, and, and more than that. So... Again, it's, you know, uh, his, uh, you have Charlemagne, you have Clovis, which is, was a very, you know, very famous king in France that also have a very dirty agenda. Uh, I don't know if you ever talked about Clovis in any of your reports, Jess. No, but, I um, haven't talked about Clovis, but Clovis had uh, some of the energy of Pan. Yeah. And so, we had some uh, issues with Pan as well, and I kept on finding... Um, that they were referring to him as Clovis also. And exactly. Pan is a real being. He's, he's definitely a, an off-world being. Mm -hmm. Very, very dark, very mischievous. And yes, I have. But I don't think uh, I've spoken but, much about Clovis. So, uh, so, so what I'm so trying to explain here is that obviously the, the, the Rome, as powerful as it was at the time of the Roman Empire, when um, it's the, the, the Christianity started, it was not as powerful in the beginning, but they literally, you know, used the whole Frank empire that was in, the core was in France, right? Pretty much, uh, even if he was living in uh, Aachen, which is Aix-la-Chapelle in, in Germany, 
Um, but it's, it, France has always have been involved with that Christianity is taking po- more power and more power over time. So when you go to the 15th century with Scalinger, again, it's happening in France with right. uh, Dionysus. So she's saying like that we were looking at pivotal times in history and yep. something coming out um, somehow connected to France. Now that I'm, there are other European countries that are affected, of course by different things, but we're just finding a thread here. And right, so what, that doesn't mean this is the only history. It's just we're looking at kind of something that's flowing together because there's there's some repeating and, and we'll get to that soon. Exactly. And what, I try, what, 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 what is fascinating for me is, of course, we know that, that the Christian religion is, you know, spread pretty much over the planet, or at least a big portion of it. But at that time, it was only spread into Europe with Charlemagne first, and then it spread out, spread out, spread out. And then, of course, in the 14th century, you know, 14, 1400s, you had Christopher Columbus going to America and starting to spread over there. In the 15th century, then you have Scalinger that decided to reform the whole history. Literally, what they did, they had access to all the books, all the old books talking about old civilization, Atlantis, everything. They literally destroy a huge portion of them, burn them because it was supposedly, you know, the the, the work of Satan, and that's you know that was that was a good uh, good excuse. Burn all the history, all traces, and then re- rewrite history. You know, the version they wanted us to pretty much um, wanted wanted us to know about. What's What's interesting? I just want to step in here. Is that they burned all the books, but for some reason they held on to uh, was it the the Codex Giga, which is uh, the Book of Satan. So is, isn't that kind of opposite of everything that they're trying to do? I yeah. mean, just, it was selective books. It wasn't mm-hmm. necessary. It has nothing to do with what's pure and what's good. That was always a guise or a disguise to cover over a deeper agenda. And they knew it, and they everybody knew it except for for us. I mean, I I think I was brought into this whole idea of you know being involved in a church. You know, I, I kind of had a spiritual experience. I get involved with the church before I know it. I'm going to a Bible school, and I spent at least five years studying church history. And people, you know, that they listen to me and they're like, well. You know, we never hear you talk about any of this stuff, but I have, I've I've talked about, you know, um, how I studied all the different Protestant movements, all the, you know, the different players that were involved and much of it, I think I closed off, you know, my memory uh, because it was overwhelming. It was the torture, the pain, the suffering all under a religion. And um, because what, what supposedly was supposed to happen as a, the, the savior um, event happened where everyone thought they were going to re- replicate it in some way. So there's a lot of torture and ascetic, uh, the ascetic life and, and people were doing some really extreme things and it became almost like sadistic. And, and you know, yet, you know, there were the common people that were just grateful for their bread and they were praying and so you it it just made me really step back and I'm like what in the world happened here and how does this translate into everything and I think when I really looked at it, it had nothing to do with the belief system it had to do with wielding the beliefs of the people whatever that was for gain and power and then it's I freed myself from the concept of the religious part of it and not blaming the religion itself, not blaming the way that people believed or anyone that brought in this teaching originally or how it transformed. And I couldn't put my point my finger at any of them. I had to just step away from it and say, you know what, this this is a belief system and it could be a belief system of anything that was twisted and turned on the people 
to manipulate a population. And here we have uh, specific individuals that were um, strategic in uh, introducing ideas that shifted the history, the whole history of humanity. And so I think they are worth looking at. I think that there's something here because if we can open this up, maybe we can make some sense as to why um, the French keep going into, you know, um, situations that that are um, upheavals that are happening in their nation and which affects all of us in a lot of different ways and has us reflect upon the behavior of humanity and the outcomes of humanity and the the inequities and how they continue to fall back into the wrong hands and how the people as much as they're fighting feel disempowered that all has to be shifted and brought back into the normal balance in a reset back to where humanity has a voice and has um, um, personal power again. So in order to get to that point, we need to kind of sort through the history of this. So um, people might be asking, why are we bringing some of this up? Because something really critical happened recently. And that was they were, they're ha they've been using this thing of um, being uh, anti-Semitic, that the French were being anti-Semitic by protesting for yeah. the, their, the true issue was because of the inequities and the lack of, um, of I don't know, not, have, not having a living wage, the issues of the increase in cost of, of uh, fuel and, you know, some basic things. And in, in their process of protesting, a peaceful process, it became very violent. And so other things are getting introduced. Other things are getting introduced that are um, not true. And so we have to, as I said, we need to step back and, and start looking at um, some of the tactic, tactics that are commonly used. It's not so much if we can get our heads out of what they're actually saying and, and focus more on what they're actually doing. And so the whole divide and conquer thing is, is a big process. So when Chris was explaining to me, well, they're bringing in that this, you know, uh, the Zionists are doing this and this, or they're accusing the, the French people of being anti-Semitic uh, and and so I'm like, all right, you know, I mean, um, it, it reminded me of when Trump was running for office or got into office and then uh, something was said where it was twisted and then all these women were angry and turned um, the election or maybe it was just Hillary running against Trump that it somehow became a battle between male and female, which had nothing to do with it. It was, it was an, uh, it's a game. It's a game that we keep falling into. Yeah. And they use, they've been using um, uh, racism. They've been using uh, the issue of religions, pitting each, each other against each other, uh, using genders um, and also orient, sexual orientations. Um, they're going to continue using these things. The question is, is how many times, how often are we going to fall for it and get caught up emotionally because they pick an issue and then they watch us crumble over it, watch us uh, come against our, our, our own people. And, you know, what is a civil war? Civil war is someone decided that if we're not going to get our way and our power, that we're going to create disruption within and have the two fighting against each other. The Revolutionary War was England against England. The Americans were, were British. 
Civil war is American against American. What does this prove? Um, well, they, they bring in the other issue, you know, of course, I'm not stepping where slavery was probably the conduit behind civil war, but some of these things could have been resolved without a civil war. But, you know, that there's, there's an empowerment for some of these elite to see the breakdown of the system and then they can go in and rewrite it, change it, change the history of it, alter who owns what. And even, you know, during the, um, the trials, the witch trials in early New England in the Boston area and or Salem, Massachusetts, a lot of people speculate that that was a land grab. You know, if, if we accuse someone of being a witch, then we have a right to take the land. The government took a lot of land. This has been going on also. And I say government, uh, those that were in charge, politicians, rulers, whoever they were. And so you have to start stepping back. I think we need to evolve from the former processes and get to a point where we're seeing what the game is that's being played out. Because if we don't do that, we perpetuate the pain. And you know who feels it? It's us. It's, it's anyone who's not a part of the elite is going to feel this. So, um, uh, which brings us to someone by the name of, uh, was it John Baptiste? Jean, Jean Baptiste, yeah. Yeah. Which one, you, which one you refer to? Yeah, Jean Baptiste. Now, was he was uh, was he involved in this um, uh, the creation of this group that we uh, talked about that was related to the Zionists, or am I thinking of something else? Yeah, I, I don't see who you're talking about here. Okay, um, maybe I'm I said his name wrong. Oh, Jean Labadie. Okay. Jean de Labadie. Yeah, it's another guy that was also in the same area, Bordeaux, which is again where uh, Scalinger was. And uh, he created also another movement um, that is connected in some way to, I mean, it, it's very complex to talk about. I, I will need pretty much three hours to talk about that whole thing here. Um, I don't want to go too much into details here, but it seems that all these big players are coming from the same area. What, what for me, because I see things from a, sometimes, you know, when you're too close to the painting, as we say, you know, you cannot see the detail. You have to, step, you know, take a few steps backward. And when I was watching all these different things, when we were watching together, all those things, you know, about the mud flood and, and the whole, you know, uh, 1500 history with Scalinger and through all these videos, it was very interesting for me to see that, yes, we know that the whole, you know, with Zoroaster, Midas, Marduk, and all these guys, Michael and Dionysus, they obviously, you know, started their agenda a long time ago on this planet. Um, but it seems that things went really crescendo, um, first starting with the Franks, but after that, you know, with Scalinger, it started to go crescendo by erasing all the history of humanity, and then a little bit further in 1812, at the time of the mud flood to literally erase a whole part of our history. And we talked about Tartarius and that whole civilization, um, which obviously had access to very specific technology. Um, and there are some pictures showing some of these uh, domes that had antennas and, or antennas everywhere in the street that could capture energy and, and, and doing a lot of things that, you know, <clears throat> right now considered to, uh, you know, are just advanced. <laughs> Advanced yeah, very, tech. very advanced. And <laughs> so we, we went backwards, which yeah, they did no, that on purpose. Yeah, yeah they called that evolution. Not a hundred percent, but yeah, we, we were going in a certain direction, and and they wanted to stop it. And uh, exactly now in this video, which is interesting, that lady is talking about, you know, the the descendants of Atlantis, which were of course, you know, very advanced. So they brought this technology in different places. This is why you can see, like we were seeing, uh, we were watching a few a few weeks ago, um, all these forts that have all these star shapes everywhere in the world. They have the same building everywhere from Egypt, Cairo, to South America, to North America, to Africa, to they have the same type of building. And I'm talking about it and specific architecture that was pre mud flood that was connected to the Tartarian or Tartarus civilization. 
and that whole thing disappeared out of nowhere pretty much i mean in a very short uh, period of time um where cities were completely uh, covered with with mud and uh, we can see these pictures of paris when they they, they they literally dig and you can see you know the layer that we can see now with the buildings and then there's a whole layer of building under that that were that have been covered with a very specific structure that you can find, you can really see that uh, imprint of Tartarus in there. There's a lot of information there, but anyway, what what for me is interesting is that that whole 200 years ago, obviously there is a huge shift happening, right? When a whole civilization was pretty much erased from the books, from our history, and pretty much every traces, they, they work very hard to erase everything as possible so that they create a new a, a new reality a new overlay i would say that for the last 100 years starting with what we call so the steampunk might be connected definitely to mobius and monarch might definitely yeah, have their- mobius and monarch yeah absolutely and like people say well how could some of this happen well that that also could fulfill and, and explain um it is a theory of mine that mobius was very much involved in that Mm-hmm. that issue that happened over in Moscow and had assisted maybe um, in the Dionysus thing that, um, you know, that the idea to come in and to, to create this whole scenario, the mud flood, because then they had what's supposedly these strange net, uh, comets or whatever that showed up because they didn't have any reference point to identify what they were. So yes, time travelers going back, messing around with things, rewriting the history Exactly. To, um, you know, better take over. Right. To reinforce their all inorganic control system that overlay um, many agendas. It's not just the, 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 the you know, the, the Christian agenda. There are different agendas that are pretty much converting into, converging to one main uh, uh, time frame, I would say. So there's many players involved in that and all the guilty ones. That's for sure. So yes, obviously, Mobius Monarch might have been, you know, uh, going back in time um, using different technology that access to, and they might very well be the one, you know, behind that whole Moscow slash St. Petersburg right. burning through a direct energy weapon. Now, right. it's funny, it's, it's interesting to see that in the in 1812, of course, you can see also that you see cities, pictures of huge cities, empty completely right. empty which Not is a very, single, very eerie and yeah. strange yeah and the only thing is they discovered that there were tons of orphans all the parents disappeared hundreds and thousands of orphans they were brought everywhere to the to the uh, the train tracks that you know they start to build the the, the train uh, network everywhere and they were bringing these kids everywhere and in the in the 1860s 1870s you see that on all the pictures everyone has pretty much the same age which is like 30 40 years later there is no very there is no old people really and you always have this picture with these men with these black hats that are controlling everything so who are these beings we don't know but it's interesting that not only the whole like, like the Marguerite artist, artist yeah, Mar- exactly. Marguerite with all the the, the hats and yes. they, they're they're leaving breadcrumbs everywhere. They're showing us okay. what it is, and you know the whole thing. Like I, I said, the whole um, monarch Mobius involvement, cyber cyber life, uh, some of the stuff that we've been talking about with Peter the Insider, and you know. I also have been talking about Dionysus and his involvement. Um, we talked about with the Andronicus transmissions about how Dionysus were going on the parallels and creating fires and literally destroying worlds um, using gas lines and all sorts of stuff that he's bringing up and just creating fires everywhere. And then around this time, the fires broke out in California and I was seeing this. I was literally having visions of it. And um, uh, someone, one of the picks who were involved, and I know this is going all over the place, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, for you that are interested in finding out some of the stuff that Dionysus has done, uh, we see that he had power, he had reign during the Roman Empire. The early Romans, the early Greeks, every, every great power in the world you know, there's there's Dionysus was involved, and then we see 
that he, uh, with Versailles in France, he, he brings in this new power structure. So um, that, that whole system comes in that way. Now, not all of the other, like uh, Greek and Roman deities, gods, whatever you want to call them, were involved in this. But Dionysus was, was definitely a, a part here. And like I said, Wood Scalinger is ironically a gentleman, if I dare call him a gentleman, uh, Dionysius. And so um, here it goes, but the question is, how did they play it out? How did they actually do it? So it's a theory. It's, it's, it's a theory that, well, I, it's, I know he was involved. I don't know how he did it, but the theory of Mobius also being involved and maybe, maybe assisting and in playing the whole thing out. And I guarantee you that one way or another, more and more information is going to come out about this. But we see that his involvement was all the way um, in our timeline. In our yeah. timeline now in California, being involved with some of these these fires. And he was threatening, he was saying stuff to me. And I know that he was involved. Um, uh, Baylord called him Leonard Crumb. That was one of his disguises. So the, they're travelers. They can do things that we can't do. We don't know how they do it. And they can shift things in such a direction that you'd say, you know, here's this one nation's in power, then another one comes into power instead. And they just find another seat, another place in, on, the, on the planet where they feel like they want to be in power. And then everything shifts in that direction because they won't live without it. And so this is not like a, like a weird conspiracy that he's been out to get us or anything like that. He's, he's hedonistic. He just likes to have all sorts of things. And there's a few different species or alien groups that are very much like this. They are the ones that are teaching certain humans or hybrid humans to um, embrace this lifestyle, take whatever they want without regard of others. And if we don't figure this out, if we don't resolve some of these issues, it's going to perpetuate. Um, the seat of France, I'll say it like that, is still is still um, a power struggle, and the reason the reason why it is the, the central focus is because I believe is Dionysus is involved, and so um, yeah. Yeah. absolutely we're going through this now. So that I was just trying to lay out that there was this whole thing of uh, this Zionist club that was kind of a and in this uh, CRIF with the Council of Represent Representative, um, the CRIF, yeah, it's the. It's in French, so you'd have to. Say yeah, it means, it's it, Well, really, what it is is something acronym. that was created in uh, and in the forties, but the first president was in forty four, and it's uh, the well, the CRIF is the French. Uh, it's an orga umbrella organization of the French Jewish organization. But really what it is, it's the official, it is the official affiliate, French affiliate of the World Jewish Congress, which is an umbrella uh, organization of the Jewish communities. And then you have the European uh, Jewish Congress. So we have the one that personally, what I feel connected to the UN, another one connected to the EU. But what's happening is right now in France, and I guess we're maybe jumping maybe in, in, into nowadays, but... Um, they literally controlled France completely. Um, but before I go there, Jess, there is something I just, I just, um, I want to add to the whole situation of 1812 so we can conclude that. Okay. Uh, my perception of all this, and I might be wrong, but it's a perception I, I just, you know, feel strongly because I guess we all have memory of really what happened in a subconscious mind. We didn't lose it. Right, to right. absolutely. That's why a lot of this is like it's like waking up from a bad dream. Yeah, and yeah. for me, what I had a feeling is that something happened. You know, with Mobius Monarch and all these, you know, the players that we talked about, Dionysus, Michael, and all that. These guys can play um, with timelines. Yes, definitely. and they can travel in time. With know. advanced tech. 
with advanced yeah. tech. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking what 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 I feel might be correct here is that at the time of Tartarus, there was good faction, bad faction, right? There was an infection, obviously, at that time. We know that. But it almost seems like, and I'm wrong, but it seems that one of these factions decided to literally take over full control over the planet, which they didn't have to that extent at that time. And by creating the 1812 situation, they literally erased memory, erased technology, erased history, and everything that, you know, the whole globe had and obviously technology as well erased all memories and knowledge of it restart everything from i wouldn't say from scratch but kind of and created their own little reality where they would be in full power all these technologies suddenly are erased pretty much of the books of memories and everything and that doesn't mean they are disappeared now they have access to these technologies and they can control it uh i mean for their own their own advantage throughout the whole planet this time. They have full control on everything. Before it was maybe more for all humans to be able to share these technologies with equality, I would say, you know, to a certain point. Yeah, but they don't yeah. want that. That's why we don't they have don't want that. They don't want the that. energy and we don't exactly. have um, some of the technology that would, you know, enhance our, our lives and, you know, make, yeah. make things a little better. So, so it's, yeah, it's definitely... Not allowed, so. or it's bought out, and, and it, it inventors is. aren't able to do certain things. It's um, a small number that can control and have access to everything, yeah. so they can have more control on, on humanity. And this is why all these technology have been erased, pretty much of all the books of history at the time. And we call that supposedly evolution since supposedly 1800. Uh, I consider that pretty much as a series of evolution. It's a regression. It's definitely not an evolution. Right. But anyway, so now they have all that power in place through finances, political, religious. I mean, they literally control the whole shebang. Um, and that's for me very interesting. Now, if we go in this time now, we talked about the CRIF, which is a, uh, it's a, an abbreviation, C-R-I-F. Um, and it's an umbrella was created literally in, uh, in the 40s, which has been created by another organization in France too called the LICRA which is against anti-Semitism and, you know, any um, anti-racism, uh, uh, I would say. But that whole thing was staged just step by step, right? Uh, around the same time, a little bit after, and, and I know I'm talking about a lot of different things here, but it's like sparkling in my in my mind right now. It's like, like <laughs> firing up. Like, yeah, um, it's, it's sort of like we're a little overwhelmed by it, putting it, all the pieces together and trying to figure out what... what the bigger well, agenda was. We know 2010, 2012, you know, we had, the, for example, here in the U.S., just talking for the U.S., we had the uh, uh, the Federal Reserve that was created, the IRS and all that stuff, right, which is a, you know, a, a very powerful tool to control people, finances and money and countries. Now, a little bit after that, they had that whole, you know, LICRA that was created in France. Uh, is there a, a international component to that? That's possible. They created then in, for, in the 40s, uh, around the Second World War, they created the CRIF, which is a, uh, um, that umbrella, right? Uh, like the, the Jewish community umbrella, uh, worldwide. And then there is one in Europe and one in France. Now, what is interesting is, obviously, they have some power because you can see everywhere in the world, if you, if you say anything that, that, that it's against the system in place, that is connected for me to the mud flood, suddenly the ultimate weapon is to call you anti-Semite. And that's what's happening to France and the, the Yellow Vest. Okay. Uh, that's what, like I ago. said, that, that, that's what they're using right now. And, yeah. you know, the next week speech. it could be another kind of hate crime or something. Well, we know this. This is the divide and conquer tac but, tactic. But, it has nothing to do with the the uh, Jewish people. No, so we're gonna no, just no, absolutely not. I want to be that sure. from the, No, no, the, yeah. No, but the question that I had earlier, because we had a discussion, and I don't know if this is speculation, or that that this group, CRIF, this CRIF group, was originally created by the Jesuits, which was, to me, was strange that it would then be connected to, Scalinger. to the uh, Zionists. So, uh, yeah, this is the threat that I was looking at. Yeah, exactly.
Like, now, so what, what do the, the so then you get back to the Jesuits? Are they in control of, of the Zionists? I mean, who who who's in power here? Well, and because it looks like the Jesuits were um, the one that ones that were wielding, you know, a lot of the decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then it becomes really strange. <laughs> well, there is, there is definitely a whole non-human group behind supporting the Jesuit agenda. Absolutely, and this is, has nothing to do with, like I said, the Jesuits do not re rep represent um, uh, the Italians no. any more than the uh, Zionists represent the Jewish people. No. Because both of them ha are like um, elite groups, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. And I want people to, to I want to make yes. sure that people understand that here, you know, when we talk about the Christianity or the Jewish, you know, the, the, the Judaic faith, we're not judging any religions here because all that is part of the game that, you know, of division and, 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 uh, yeah, division and control. Yeah, we're you looking know, at the systems. We're not, looking at the system yeah. behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the people are excluded from this conversation. Because we know the people are the ones that are suffering. So exactly, um, exactly. And, and a lot of, a lot of unnecessary wars and all this stuff has been going on just because of these very same reasons. Um, all right, so we're going to move on from this topic because I okay. think I think we've, we've said been enough. In, yeah. And this is just to update people with what's happening in this act. This is one of many. So each each act has its own drama. Doesn't it? Yes, there is always there is there is always that same um, that same uh, I would say foundation, which pretty much is you know they want to have more freedom, they want to have they're they, they're not against paying tax, they just want it to be more fair, and they realize there is a whole system in France that's obviously yeah. sucking all they the want money a living wage. and giving to the the one percent now. That was in the very beginning, but it's funny, it's interesting because it's a very young movement. It's only, we think about it, four months old. And most of them had no clue when they started going to the streets, they, they just, was just for the gas price. But slowly they start to go to internet and all that, they start to do all kind of research and they start to educate themselves and understand a little bit more what was going on. Now it evolves, right? And which is, which is amazing for me because it's not something stagnant. It's in a, uh, it's a life, I would say. So lately, they have tried different things. In the beginning, they were very angry, and then they were, I mean, it was very violent. Um, the police was very violent because they tried to portray them as uh, aggressive people when simply because they didn't accept that the, the people were going in the street and didn't accept anymore the way they were treated. So they started, the, 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 the state, well, Macron and the government start to go against the yellow vest with brutality and violence, which never really stopped. I mean, it's still the same. That didn't work really to control them. So they tried something else. As I said in the earlier report, they told them that, you know, they told the, through the media, which is their uh, main weapon to control the, uh, the French people, at least try to is to portray the yellow vest as toothless, ridiculous idiots, uneducated, you know, uh, unemployed people that don't work and are lazy. Which is not the case. These people work from Monday to Friday and they take their weekends, evenings and nights to fight for their rights. So that didn't work either. So they went to the next step after that a few weeks after and they were still, you know, very violent and, and I mean, the number of wounds and people on custody um, start to get bigger and bigger, but they still didn't want to mention that uh, in the news. They were always portraying Yellow Vest as violent. Then they start to portray them as, oh, they're extreme right, extreme left. That didn't stop the movement either. So the last thing they had in their arsenal was, well, we have to do something, which is now the ultimate weapon um, the situation was created when three, four people, I guess, you know, saw someone in the street that they recognized as someone, I would say, that didn't work for the French government or for, for, for France, but more for, I would say, an in international lobby. I don't want to go in detail here. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, um, the news, of course, was there. All well, that seems to be very, 
military stage and three, four people were screaming at that guy and automatically it went national overnight as the French Yellow Vest are anti-Semite. And which is funny because you have lots of people from the you know, Muslim faith, you have a lot of, um, of, of Jewish uh, in, in the protests. There, there was their kippah, their stars, and they work next to each other. There's, there's none of that hate at all. It's a complete opposite. But the media uh, do everything they can to li- literally portray them as racist and assignment. I, I mean, they try, they put every label possible on them. So that didn't work really either, um, since a lot of um, French yellow vest of Judaic faith came uh, forward and say, "Hey guys, that's 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 wrong because that's not true at all. These people, I mean, that there is they are they are united. Uh, there is fraternity." brotherhood it doesn't matter what religion what color if you left right they don't have any division they might have some opinions but they say even if we talk to someone of a complete opposite opinion i wouldn't have talked to maybe six months ago suddenly they realize that we're all united in the same with the same fight which is to save humanity right literally and, and so uh, so that's why i'm saying is, is is to feed into this is um is exactly what they want. They were, it's, it's a stumbling block. Yeah, they try to divide. It's a, it's a divide and conquer. Um, you know, if, if, if the issue is about not having a living wage, why is this not being addressed? Instead, they're, dra- they're dragging this out. People are getting hurt. They're manipulating uh, the peaceful protest into a violent one. They're planting people to create violent scenarios, yeah. and then they're they're assuming that the general public, the rest of the world, can't see. But people have been catching it on on their cameras and and uh, on their phones, so they're recording uh, some of these incidences, and it's getting uh-huh. out. And so it's humiliating to them. I think that they weren't prepared for this. They weren't accustomed to um, exposure they had. Obviously, you don't usually think of uh, France as, you know, um, a government that's really, like, extremely controlling where you, you don't know what's going on, you know. this. But for some reason, it's starting to look that way. And the people, you know, typically, you know, the news wasn't 100% hidden, but I think now um, there's an embarrassment and of course, what what exacerbates it even more is that Macron was like a leader in 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 representative or working alongside the EU. So it drags in the EU, yeah. and uh, so there's in levels of embarrassment and pressure that's going yeah. on. And so in order to, I think one of the agendas that he had was to distract from what was what was going on in his country and started to focus on Venezuela and Maduro. That was mm-hmm. one of the discussions we had. So now what does he have? Um, he, you know, they, they're, they're frustrated. They have to throw some, you know, something else in there to stop this. They're going to probably use anything they can to stop it. But the problem is, is the care, you know, the world is going to see it. And now that they're caught, um, so it's gone too far, and if they just were humane and acknowledged that the people needed some help and that they were asking for what is considered basic needs, then um, why push them to that degree other than the extreme levels of insensitivity? Mm-hmm. And like I said, you know, this this um, this Dionysian uh, attitude of, you know, I if I can't have fun, everyone else is going to suffer. And you know, I'm supposed to be playing right now, and here you are complaining about food. You know, there's there's just this attitude uh, that if it was resolved, if there was any type of uh, human compassion whatsoever, this none of this would have happened. There would have been an adjustment in the in the tax for for the the, uh, the gas. Um, there would have been some type of 
of uh, alleviation or whatever they needed to uh, help the people get what they need. I don't think that they're asking for anything that that was wrong. I mean, they, they sh no one should have to work for hours and come home and still not be able to feed their family. I mean, that's that's outrageous. Well, the, the government gave an answer to their request. They, on the 1st of uh, February, they increased by uh, 7% the price of uh, the most essential food, of uh, anything essential for, uh, you know, all the, the basic needs, I would say. They yeah, increase the uh, also commodities, the basic, the commo yeah, yes, yeah. basic commodities, the taxes on poor people, on the people that barely have a retirement, work their whole life and barely have nothing. They so add more taking money to that. More and, and, yeah. and oppressing them further. So the thing is this, at this point, the, they were saying, all right, well, what we want to have as French people, we want to have more saying in the different laws that are that you are pushing to a throat without asking our, you know, if we agree or, or not. Obviously, we want to have more saying in it. So all we ask is for a referendum on some of these laws and just ask like they do in Switzerland. And that is the ultimate insult of King Macron, of the emperor, Napoleon slash Macron, because that is Dionysus. an insult <laughs> to his intelligence and his charm that it's impossible. How can someone not like him? Or not right. agree with this plan, and the people are like, listen. We <laughs> we're not two years old, okay? Stop fooling us. You charmed us. You came out of nowhere. You charmed us. You lied to us, and you do the exact opposite. So, I mean, how would you think that the people would not see that? So I've been now, talking about Macron for about two years now, if, okay. if not maybe three years in the Andronicus transmissions. I was bringing up that he was connected to Dionysus, and I said it early on. If, if, if Dionysus is there, there's going to be problems. And I tell, there were the, those strange fires that happened out of nowhere yeah. um, related to uh, some of the, the nuclear plants that they had. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. no one said anything. Nope. It exposed the people. It was, bar it was barely in the news. No, but France is an amazing country because when you have Chernobyl, that happened, you know, and uh, was it in 86 or like in the 80s? And a whole nuclear cloud was crossing Europe. That cloud was so clever that they stopped at the border of France, went around it, but never touched France. Never. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that was a clever cloud. <clears throat> and I mean, the whole thing is... is it's insane when you hear them talking. Now, what, what is scary here is that they're changing bit by bit the whole constitution um, without people, you know, uh, agreeing with it or not. Um, for example, they have changed the whole law about protest. Protest is, a, I mean, everywhere in the world, you have the right to protest. I don't say to be violent, but you have the right to protest, especially in France, which is the country of human rights. That's where the human rights... Uh, a chart has been uh, signed. So they change a lot to a point where now it's even illegal to protest. One, they went further that if you even, before you even, and we talked about that earlier, even if they, they, they can look at you and say, hmm, it seems you're going to be violent, so therefore we can arrest you. I mean, with, with no proof of nothing. That's the second thing. And now if the, the, the last law that just passed is that if you are caught in a protest when there is any violence whatsoever, automatically you are um, guilty of being uh, accomplice. No, I say that in English. Um, complicit. Say that in English? Is you know, a comp in complying with it or? No, no, that, no. that, that automatically uh, if one person is is being an accomplice, the an, 50, accomplice. 000, an accomplice uh, automatically any of the 50,000 100,000 people they, they they can find is automatically will be charged with the same uh with the same uh penalty like if he was the one doing it even if he's just walking nicely and peacefully and so that's how far it goes 
Um, they are just changing right now, last week, the whole justice system where, you know, if you had to go to court, you go in your own city. Well, now you have to go 200, 300 miles further because you cannot go in your own, in your own city anymore or you have to go online. If you go to a court, there is no uh, popular jury anymore. You know, like you have a jury here for every uh, every trial. Um, have like t- the jurors, right? Twelve of them or ten, depending. Well, now they erase that. So normally there was a separation between the state and justice, the justice body of France. Now they're erasing everything to a point where the government is pretty much in charge of the justice. That means. There is no independence of justice anymore at all. So all the lawyers, all the judges in France, I mean, they were in the streets <clears throat> protesting, saying, hey, wait a minute, this is crazy what you're doing here because we're supposed to be independent. But this is this is becoming one of these countries where uh, the government, the president or whatever, like, you know, like Maduro, they, they, they pretty much are in charge of everything. And there is no separation and it depends anymore of the justice and the government. So it's getting is getting more and more and more into a Mussolini type of uh, of uh, constitution, I would say. And this is why it's scary. Is that doesn't matter what people do in the street; they continue their agenda and push it as hard as the they people can. People are not heard. The people no. you said the people are not heard at all. Absolutely not. And it's a huge disconnect between the leadership and the people, and um, it's a bad combination. And why is it that people don't learn from history? Learn something that, you know, certain behaviors engender other outcomes that they probably think that they're going to gain from it never ends in the right way. It's almost like they're shocked. Well, well how, how did this happen? And then it snowballs. And it gets, yeah. it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it amazes me of how many leaders fall into the same thing. It's like they're they're in illusion. They they completely get wrapped up in their own um, uh, imperialistic kind of uh, view of themselves, and they can't imagine that the people would not, you know, obey or or you know have some kind of commitment uh, that's, it seems like it's an unnatural expectation of adoration that they're, they're expecting. And with, with what in return? Nothing. Nope. You nope, know, nothing. Um, people aren't grateful to just have them in their presence. They, they, they've gone beyond that point. And I don't know if being in a position of a leadership that it brings you to that scale of of um, a disproportionate perspective of their own ego. And, you know, here here is the uh, beginning of the fall where you lose track or sight of the people around you and assume some kind of, you know, elitism, uh, king, uh, like as if uh, being a king or even you look back in history and, and many of the Caesars perceive themselves as gods. So in any any of this type of stuff, it's been going on since the beginning of recorded history of leaderships getting out of control. But the problem is, is the people always, and they'll suffer, but in the end they usually win. And so yeah. I, I don't really know the point other than they know that they're on their way out, so they're just going to make it painful. Which which brings me back to um, what are the casualties? I think you, you were telling me what some of the casualties. Yeah, I mean talking. it's 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 insane. I mean, um, first the police brutality. They they made a, a chart of all the, the the worst countries in the world. France is between Venezuela and Haiti when it comes to uh, police brutality and, uh, you know, injustice. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, that's quite a statement, bad. isn't it? It is a statement. So let's go on the numbers. All right. So on um, Act 16, the number is, and tell me if that sounds for you like a country that's, you know, supposedly connected to the human rights. Um, there are 2,000 wound, wounded people. On the 2,000 wounded people, there are 18 eyes lost, 
there are around 20 or 30, uh, between 20 and 30 people that received these flashball in the face and have their jaw, their forehead completely. I mean, I mean, these guys are completely, they lost literally. They, they, the need, they need, they need reconstruction of their oh, face. Uh, some even of after them, that, yeah. it's, 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 it's really Some of them have brain injuries. Brain injuries, coma. I mean, um, there are 12 dead um, 8,000 people in custody. Some even didn't reach the protest. They were taken out of their car. Oh, you have a yellow vest? Boom, custody. You go into a protest, automatically going to be violent, automatically we put you in custody for 48 hours, uh, with um, attached with, of course, uh, handcuffs to a piece of, you know, to the, the a little wood bank, like a, a bench they're sitting on for 48 hours, not allowed most of the time to go to the bathroom. They have to pee on themselves. Um, then they have to release them after 48 hours. On the 8,000 uh, that were caught in custody, um, 1,796 have been directly, not six months later, directly within two days, sent to jail, sentenced and sent to jail for three to six to one year, six months to one year for violence in the protest. And violence means you have a weapon. Let me tell you the weapon. Um, for example, you have uh, uh, a paper mask and some saline water for the, you know, for the gas. Oh, uh, that can be very dangerous. Oh, you have an umbrella. That's dangerous. It's a weapon. Uh, you have a flag with a little stick of wood, you know, to carry the flag. That's it. That's a weapon. I mean, anything, anything and everything. It's a weapon. Boom. Go to jail. You were close to someone that was violent. Boom. That's it. And since the police, um, you know, if the police said, oh, it was violent against us, even if there are videos showing that it's the opposite, the word of the police is always priority on everything you say. Most of the time, they only have the right to have a lawyer. They deny the right to have a lawyer to represent them. I mean, it's insanity. Yeah. It Severe is violation of human rights. I'm not talking about, um, I just saw pictures today. I'm. I mean, it's insane. You see a couple, very nice dressed, 50 years old, you know, just walking in the street and they go to the police. They ask to go through, you know, we would like to go back to <laughs> live in that street. And the police tell them, no, you're not allowed to. She says, well, I'm not a yellow vest. I'm, I'm, I'm living here. And she starts to get upset. And then you see 10 cops jumping on the woman, grabbing her by the hair, throwing her on the floor, beating the crap out of her with their sticks and... And then they told the, the in the news it was said that she was extremely violent, that she threatened the cops, that she beat up the cops, and therefore it was absolutely okay for them to respond uh, the way they did. It's insane. Everything is on video. I mean, they lost their mind. But here is the problem. Here comes the spring now. So the yellow vest didn't stop with the winter, the rain, the cold. They were there. Now comes the spring, which means warmer weather. You have a police that for four months haven't got a single day off, not a single day off, haven't seen their family. And now they know that the day is going to be longer. People are going to be more in the street than ever because the, the, the good days are coming. Um, with the heat, the cops with all their uniforms is going to be harder and harder. They barely have water. They barely have food. I'm talking about the police, right? They're not taken care of. They get to a point of exhaustion. So that can lead to a lot of different things that might not be pretty. So this is why the Yellow West are pretty much saying, hey, you know, with time, eventually, they might break and realize that all oh, this makes no sense and they might join us. That's pretty much the wish the Yellow West have. It's not going in that direction, though, but we'll see. But this is what, what's happening now. And there are so many events happening in France in the same time as the Yellow Vest are happening. Um, I'm not talking about protest. I'm talking about the World Cup of uh, feminine soccer. I'm talking about different things. So these, the, 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 the unions of the police were just saying, we know for the next six months, already we're exhausted. We won't have a day off for the next six months. And we're not even talk about the overtime that's never paid, ever. Is, so, is there anything... In, in our horizon that is positive regarding the situation right now? Well, there is. 
there is. And what I'm going to say seems might seems weird for a lot of people, but um, in the very first report, I was I was saying that you cannot fight the system within the system or playing by the rules of the system. Okay, so I was watching a video um, of a lady called uh, Guylaine uh, Longto. She's a lady that was a doctor in the 90s. And, and I mean, that lady was very clever. And she kind of like made a decision, understood something. She she was saying in, the, in her uh, video that the system that's in place, it's literally a system of absolute control right where human or humanity doesn't exist is not considered and she was saying that obviously humans are every human every human being every person has a master in that system here the master we have is or an external master or an internal master and she was explaining that obviously we were giving our power away to a government, to a lawyer, to a, to a doctor, you know, to something always external to us. And she said there's two traps in that system. The first trap, and we talked about that, right? The, the trap of the carrots and the trap of the stick. The trap of the carrots is for the sheeps, the white sheeps. For example, well, you know, if you don't have a job, no worries, we give you food stamps, we give you this, we give you that. But if you don't agree with us, well, then you have nothing. So most of the people will be like, okay, or if you want to have your food stamps, you need to take that vaccination. Okay, and people say, all right, I will, I will do that. That's the carrot. We give you some money and you become dependent of the government. Or, that's an example, or you have the, uh, the, the trap of the stick. That's for those who realize, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to accept that. So, of course, they rebel, they revolt, they protest. And what's happening is that, well, if you don't want to listen to the system and give your power away to us, well, at that point, we're going to remove you, remove your freedom. We're going to put you in jail. And some of them will be like, all right, okay, send me to jail. But in the same time, you have never recovered your total sovereignty. So what she discovered to her, her own experience is there's a third way. The third way is to realize that it is important that you understand that these systems, it's like a body, it's a corporation, right? Like the corporation of America, the corpor it's a corporation, right? It's all system it's for me connected to the mud flood in some way, shape or form. And that the corporation, every corpse has a soul. Now that corporation has no soul. She was explaining like, you know, like an analogy. They need fuel. They need something to, 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 to have that power functioning and they need that fuel. And the fuel is us, our souls. We give, we give away our power to something that's external to us. And she was saying the important thing is to be able to say, well, whatever choice you give me, I do not consent very politely thank you very much i do not consent i do not agree i'm a free being i'm my own creator of my own creation i'm my own master and i'm connected to my divine soul and this is the only thing i receive you know i, I have a connection with nothing external everything internal and she was explaining that this is the biggest fear these parasite corporations inorganic controlled system whatever you want to call it uh, that that's the biggest fear they have is that human understand that they have spent these different inorganic control system have spent a lot of time and energy to make humans believe that they have no power that they need a government and assistance of you know uh, an external body to pretty much protect them control them and feed them and so on and that they were not never connected to something higher than that right but the biggest fear they had is to that the human understand, hey, wait a minute. Um, no, I'm a sovereign, divine being. And from now on, I don't give my power away to anyone, so I do not consent, I do not agree. Yeah. I reclaim my own sovereignty and my own freedom, and I'm not giving you my power away anymore. And it's like you unplug. And mm -hmm. it's like you have an engine, there is no more battery, no more, no more gas, guess what? It's dying. Well, it's like, it's like um, Mandela, what he did. It's like what um, Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi did, Martin Luther King. 
there was actually a, a protester, an Irish protester, who made a stand and refused to eat. I mean, there's been, you know, certain people that were, he was imprisoned at the time. I can't think of his name. But there, there are people that, that come to this realization. Yeah. And, and uh, they happen to be in levels of leadership, so the others get to watch it, and it transforms something. Changes it. Yes. It helps people in a unified way to, to realize that this is a paradigm that is imposed upon them. It's not something they consented or agreed to, and that they can rise above it and they can actually shift it, yes. shift out of it. And so many times, people are defeated before they're defeated. If they're if in their mind. They are repeating the idea that they're going to lose, that they're just going to get injured, that they're going to lose more. Then it it creates this this mass agreement mm-hmm. of 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 defeat, and so well, you yeah. need to have, despite what's going on on the outside, you have to come to a resolve that mm-hmm. there is a purpose behind some of these incidences. It's to help people to awaken and to remember that they don't have to be a part of any particular slave system mm-hmm. and that they need to break away from yes. whatever this, whatever the experience was before. Mm-hmm. The assembly line mentality, uh, the point where, you know, that there's levels of slavery that are not spoken about. There's, you know, the direct slavery that we see that's very overt, but it's the more insidious one, or maybe not more insidious, but also very insidious, of the hidden ones, the hidden yes. types of slavery. There's no more chains anymore, no visible chain like, no. you know, there was in the, you know, in the past. And, and the, the, the thing that they do is when you start to rise above it, they throw all these different accusations, these, um, you know, distractions, and whatever, and, and here's another thing uh, that's part of the game, and Peter always talks about what's the name of the game, you know, that's the, that's exactly what it is. This whole, All these agendas are games. It's like a massive chess game, and that's why, you know, you see the Masonic Lodge with all this the checkerboard images of you know black and white or whatever the Alice in Wonderland illusion, mm-hmm. because they're turning very serious circumstances into a game. I mean yeah. that's not the only reason for those that symbology, but I believe that's that's a part of it. It's one a of the symbolic games of are, duality, you know. Yeah, and it is duality too. Well, one of the, one of the games that they play is that here you are, this one group, the French people are proclaiming their freedom, their sovereignty, and saying, we're willing to stand out here, and then someone comes along and takes it from them and says, this is our fight, and that, that we want this and this and this, and then they take that from them again. And these, these are the games, the many, many, there's so many different variations of it, but it continues over and over and over again. And if you understand, as Peter says, Peter the Insider, if you understand what the name of the game is, then you can get around it. Then you can figure it out. Then you can rise to your own realization yes. that you you are empowered. I you know people have asked me about you know well, what about this? The government expects that you have to pay taxes. You have, see you know money is money. That's their god. It's not ours. Nope. We know that we can survive and we can thrive. And the universe has given us the ability to thrive and and they do not determine our soul and our soul journey and our experience. And if we needed to, if if something really happened, I believe that the universe would provide for us whatever we need. Because it's happened to me in my life. I personally experienced this. And I know that when you get out of the level of fear and the level of dependency upon systems, upon governments, and you start seeing that you're self-empowered and you start seeing that 
um, you can work in a collaborative way, separate from all of that. And having certain plans and, and ideas and um, trusting and going within, doing your meditation, whatever it is, you feel confident that if anything ever happens to you, you know that uh, you are an immortal being, that you will live, um, you know, maybe not in this dimension, but your soul continues on in one way or another. Exactly. And once you become liberated from all of this, you can step away from certain things. And I'm not telling people to go in the woods and just, you know, get off grid or whatever. I mean, that's a choice. Some people do that. It's not an easy one. Uh, there are still ways to claim your sovereignty, being within in um, the uh, within society, and not cutting off communication and contact, not being in fear of of uh, whether it's AI or any other type of control system, and asking that none of this affects you, that it all bounces off of you, and that you are um, free of all of it. And, and it starts to set things in motion in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It has to start from within if you want it to manifest on the outside. And so, um, uh, with this said, I think that we have covered this topic for mm -hmm. tonight. Yep. I encourage everyone to have their mugs that says, no fear, no master, only freedom. That's a good start. Yeah, the new Teespring, the new Teespring <laughs> yeah. mugs that we put together, and I'm, yeah, I, I'm sorry that well, there's uh, shipping costs and all this other stuff, but let me tell you something, this stuff's coming from the heart. We're not going to make a whole lot of money out of it, it's not about that, it's about having, people have been asking us to have the symbols, the symbols are powerful, mm. it's the highest potential for humanity, if that, if that helps you to stay in your place of manifestation. Having that symbol there, just to remind you, and, and Andronicus gave that the, the design of the symbols to help support us to um, stay on the timeline where we reach our highest potential, that we're not limited in any way. The only, uh, and so we have that. We also have some shirts and, and uh, cups and some other items that have the yellow vest on it, if you want to support that as well. Yeah. But like I said, you know, it's, it's, um, you don't make a whole lot of money off of it. It's not about that. It's about getting the word out, having, you know, a conversation piece, uh, something like that. But um, we, we're here to support you in any way, whether it's to the uh, videos of what we're talking about. Um, I don't, we don't need the ego or anything like that. We just, oh. We just want to get the information out, and I'm glad that people are catching on. I'd love the comments, uh, keep adding to it, and I love when people add links, and we're going to have some links in there as well um, mm -hmm. regarding yep. some of the stuff of the mud flood that we talked about, and also um, some of the other um, articles and, and things that are related to our topic. So um, stay in a high vibration. Let's rise above it. And those of you that you, you don't have to be French to get involved. It has nothing to do with France. It has to do nope. with humanity. Yes. I agree. So, I'm, I'm very happy you say that, Jess, because I'm, I mean, a lot of people might say, oh, okay, France, France, or it's far away from us. This is so much more than that. This is what we talk about, the mud flood and all that, things that have affected the whole planet. The, it, I mean, it's really a... It's, I wouldn't say a fight, a battle, a war. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use these words, but it's literally, yeah, humanity waking up to the realization, remembering who we are mm -hmm. as an individual, sovereign beings, sovereign divine beings. And so it starts in France because I guess they are the loudest and <laughs> they never had a problem to protest, but it's spreading everywhere. And it's in Algeria, it's in everywhere in Europe. I mean, it's just... Because the news, they make sure that nobody sees what's happening in a neighbor country. So it makes you feel like you're the only one to go through that. But it's not the case. It's everywhere. There is a, 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 a pretty much like a, an awakening happening, planetary. And I think it's very encouraging. It is encouraging. And so the, 
even though some of these stories are, you know, kind of upsetting and you can see the game yeah. being played out. It's the same old game over and over again. Yeah. But we're gonna we're gonna hold on to the highest potential yes. for the situation, Absolutely. and no matter uh, what they throw out there. And as far as I'm concerned, the people have already won. They've already made this statement. If it's stopped tomorrow, they've already made their statement. But I don't. I think this is is going to. Um, someone intelligent needs to step in and and just do the right thing. So. Um, we're going to just manifest that the right thing happens and that also um, some of these issues regarding the EU also. Uh, they want to do a Frexit, let them do a Frexit. Let them yeah. do a Brexit. Um, however they they need to uh, handle it, uh, let the people speak. That's what I say. Once and, you're connected to your divine consciousness, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, and that's my true belief. I truly believe that. Once you're connected to your divine consciousness, you can come up and, and literally create, as a whole, as human, a, 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 an absolutely, an incredible uh, uh, outcome, way beyond what we can even imagine. This is what we are. We're creators. What you believe in, you will see. So, believe in ourselves. That's very important. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, this is, and I appreciate everyone that's listening. Hopefully, you walk away with some ideas. Feel free to share your ideas in the comments comment section. And uh, let's continue uh, to hold the space, hold the intention for not only the French people, add some protection to some of them too, some of those young people that are, and old people. Um, and, and all of them actually, you know, protection, safeguard them energetically, and let's um, let's wake up uh, the system so that the elite lose power. We we need we need some equity. We need some kindness and human expression here. So uh, with that said, thank you, thank you everyone, thank you Chris, thank you, <coughs> thank you Jessica, support. thank you so much. And we appreciate you supporting the channel. Have a good night, everyone. Because of the inequities. Because of the inequities. Because of the inequities. You have been listening to Androna Talks Radio. Join us on YouTube channel, Jessica Errol Morocco and visit her website at www.readingsbyarial.com.